And on behalf of the Western Lane Fire and EMS Authority, Sayusla Valley Fire and Rescue, and Western Lane Ambulance District Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome everyone to the May 28th, 2020 board meeting. I would ask non-directors to mute your microphone, keep them muted to cut down on the background noise. In the event that a director loses their connection, please contact Dina as Alan did, and we'll assist you in getting you back on. Uh, would everyone please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> So Mary, can you take a roll call vote of all three agencies? Yes. For SBFR, we have Director Green. Here. Director Hickson. Here. Director Burns. Director Burns. You got it. There he goes. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Director Polisi. Here. And Director Spade. Here. Western Lane Ambulance, Director Yesney. Here. Director Russell. Here. Director Murphy. He's muted. Here. He said here. Director Farnsworth. Here. Director Webb. Here. Wolfia, Director Green. Director Hickson, Director Yesney, and Director Farnsworth. Here. So we have quorums in place for all three agencies. Thank you, Mary. So now we're going to go for approval of the agenda. I'd like a motion and second from each agency, and we'll follow that with a roll call vote. Um, we'll start with a motion and second from Western Lane Ambulance District. I move to approve the agenda as submitted. That was Mike Webb? Yes. Cindy Russell seconds. Director Yesney. Yes. Director Russell? Yes. Director Murphy? Yes. Director Farnsworth? Yes. And Director Webb? Yes. So now for Sayusla Valley Fire and Rescue, I need a motion and a second. Like so moved. That was Alan Burns. Uh, I will second motion. Ed Hickson seconded. Director Green? Yes. Director Hickson? Yes. Director Burns? Yes. Director Polisi? Yes. Director Spade? Yes. I'd like a motion and a second from Western Lane Fire and EMS Authority to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion. Director Farnsworth? Second from Ron Green. Okay, Ron, thanks. Director Green? Yes. Director Hickson? Yes. Director Yesney and yes. Director Farnsworth. Yes. Okay, thank you everybody. So we're now going to proceed to public comments. We have seven individuals who've signed up. And the order of the speakers was derived from when they notified us that they would like to speak. I will say the name and the place on our list for each speaker. I would ask that the speaker then identify themselves and give their address. Dina will start a timer when you begin speaking, and you will have three minutes to make your comment. First up is Mr. R.J. Pilcher. I am R.J. Pilcher, 87842 Sandra Street, Florence, Oregon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. You all have the material I prepared to help balance the budget, emailed to you by John, and in the back of the packet for the record. I'd like to take a few minutes to go over the facts. Personnel services is 58.69% of total expenditures. Paramedic top base rate is $84,140 a year or 46.9% over the 90th percentile of paramedics in the state of Oregon. Paramedic supervisor's top base rate is $96,761 a year or 68.94% over the 90th percentile of paramedics in the state of Oregon. 
EMT's top base rate is 61,516 a year or 37% over the 90th percentile of EMTs in the state of Oregon. Incidental, incidental overtime support sick call ins and vacation relief is $234,153 or 10.59% of personnel services operations budget. Vacations, one month's vacation during the first year of employment for each year thereafter. Five weeks vacation per year at year six and six weeks vacation per year at year 10 and beyond. Ability to, to accumulate close to a year sick time, 2,500 hours. Individual health insurance premium, 100% paid by the district. Dependent health insurance premium, 90% paid by the district. Zebra account to cover deductibles and co-pays, 100% paid by the district. PERS contribution, 100% paid by the district. Gym membership, 100% paid by the district. Long-term disability, 100% paid by the district. As of December 31st, 2017, the unfunded liability owed PERS by the district was $2.87 million. This is a debt the district owes its employees through PERS. The balance sheet does not show the true financial picture without PERS unfunded liability being part of the conversation and inserted into the balance sheet. In conclusion, the time is now to take control and do the right thing for the public you serve. It is always important to treat all the employees of Western Lane Ambulance District with dignity and respect. Your true and only fiduciary responsibility is to the ratepayers. I am not sure the ratepayers would be willing to approve an option levy if they knew how much overmarket payroll and benefits are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pilcher. Second on our list is Danielle Holmes. Hi, my name is Danielle Holmes. My address is 91358 Poodle Creek Road in no time. So good evening. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Danielle Holmes. I've been an employee for Western Lane Ambulance for the past 14 years, most currently holding a position as critical care paramedic. Before that, I was a firefighter with Cecil Valley for six years. I've been out of work on leave for the past three months. I've not hidden the fact that I'm on leave due to my deteriorating mental state, including my PTSD, depression, and acute anxiety disorder. However, whenever I mention that I'm on leave from work for these things, not one person has ever asked why. They haven't because there's no need to. The public seems to have a higher understanding about what happens on this job than some of our board members or chief recognized. Without breaking HIPAA laws, I'm gonna break down for you some of the hell I've endured over my 16 years in EMS. I've witnessed the death of a coworker. I've witnessed the death of people I loved and admired and prayed in vain while I tried to save them. I still cannot get the screams out of my head of the countless family members as we tried desperately to save their loved ones only to hear it again when they learned that we failed. I've seen babies take their first breaths and ones that will never breathe again. I have seen triaged one person to save another while they screamed at me to stop and save their friend. My hands have done more things than my mind will never forget. You say that we're overpaid because we get eight hours of overtime a shift. Do you think for one second that work is dropped off at the door when we leave? I can attest that it doesn't. I can attest that we go home so physically and mentally exhausted that we're zombies for the next 24 hours, unable to fully engage our families or even tell them what's wrong. And do you think that over time will make up for all of the monumental events that we've missed with our families to be at work? Holidays, birthdays, sporting events, watching our children take their first steps or say their first words. Why don't we just take those days off? because no one wants to burden another employee with any more time away from their families. You say we're overpaid comparing us to comparable agencies. There are no comparable agencies. Western Lane is in a league of their own and we have worked tirelessly to get there. We've put in more time and training than anyone to make sure that we're the best any ground agency in the state of Oregon has. We take all the critical care patients from Peace Harbor, the ones that will die if they're not transferred and get them safely to a higher facility. We do this trans with transport times four times that of a flight nurse or flight medic has to deal with. So if you want to compare us to someone, compare us to them. Right now you have the best of the best because you pay them the best of the best and there are people who care and love this community. But with the cuts the chief is proposing, you will not be able to retain the experience, compassion or dedicated employees you have now. 
you will be left with high turnover people who are just looking for a few extra bucks because no one will be able to financially live in this community without that. As a union, we've always tried to work with our administrative staff, both on and off negotiations, including refraining from writing numerous grievances for contract matters. We still want what is best for this agency and have been willing to work to cut back on whatever we have to, as long as it doesn't jeopardize care of a patient. Ms. Holmes, I'm sorry, we reached the end of your three minutes. Thank you for your comments. Third on our list is MJ Church. <clears throat> MJ, are you there? I think she is, but I don't see her. Oh, there's an, she's right the, I see MJ. MJ, can you, do you have an audio that you can click? Hold on. We can come back to her. Okay. Or, or whoever that is. Um, our fourth public comment is from Dr. Dana Gellis. Hi, everybody. Sorry about the uh, camera issue. I wasn't, uh, I was going to kind of wait till the end to, to give my thoughts, but I can put a, a few in there now. Thank you. Uh, Danielle is right in that we are a very unique district. There is no other district in the state that has the amount or the percentage of critical care um, trained medics that we have. We are in Florence in a bit of a unique situation and that we're a good hour plus from any higher level care, uh, meaning Riverbend most of the time, sometimes Salem, sometimes Portland. But because of that and because of the overall increase in patient visits and the high acuity of our patients in general, we have a much higher admission and transfer rate than most other hospitals due to the basically the elderly nature of our town, being the oldest town in the state of Oregon. Um, we have sicker patients in general, so we have a much higher uh, need to admit to our hospital, which is often filled up, and then therefore need to transfer. Because of that, we are transferring sick patients an hour plus by ground to Riverbend on a daily basis, often many times per day. These patients aren't just broken femurs from the dunes that need a morphine uh, every 20 or 30 minutes. These are people that have, that are in cardiopulmonary failure or on multiple drips, um, need ventilator management because their airway is being controlled um, by a machine. And these are not things that a basic paramedic can, is designed or trained to handle. We are incredibly blessed to have these critical care paramedics in our service. And I have a fear uh, that should we not reward them for their efforts in getting to that stage, being critical care medics, we will lose them. And I, I know that even though they are well compensated, I see the burnout on their faces every day. And it's not going to surprise me if we lose them regardless, but we need to do everything we can to keep our care, our EMS care at the level it is. And these guys and gals work continuously to improve. Um, it's, it's been an honor to be with a group that is so motivated. And I just hope it can continue in the status quo and I will do everything in my power uh, to ensure that it does. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Danagellis. Next, our fifth speaker on our list is Mike Cavan. Hey, uh, Mike Haven, 160 Madison, Eugene. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike. I'm the president of the Lane Professional Firefighters Association. We're the union representing the professional firefighters and paramedics in Lane County, including Western Lane Ambulance. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, to the budget committee presentation held on May 14th as it relates to our members and the executive session planned this evening. Uh, we have a long, proud tradition of working collaboratively 
with many of the employers whose employees we represent in Lane County, including Western Lane Ambulance. Here locally, we've worked closely with previous management teams to increase service and reduce overtime. We have a history of being creative with other agencies facing financial challenges, as our common goals include the interests and welfare of the public we serve. I'm not part of the bargaining team for the Western Lane contract, but my vice president uh, read me in on some of the proposals at the table to say we were blindsided uh, by wage freezes, uh, cuts to certification pay, retirement and benefits being presented to the budget committee prior to any agreement on an open, on an open contract is an understatement. That action tests the decorum of the bargaining process and sends a bad message to the employees of the district. There is a clear breakdown in the relationship between labor management and the elected officials given the lack of information being provided to warrant the cuts presented to the budget committee. With our attempts to access information and have dialogue with the chief regarding long-term financial strategies being blocked, I get the feeling that there's something more at play. Our members work hard every day to earn and preserve the respect of the community they serve. The members of Western Lane Ambulance provide the highest level of service in Lane County to a community situated over an hour from the closest full service hospital. Despite enjoying overwhelming support from their com community, district leadership is shutting our members out of the discussion and publicly attacking their wages and benefits. Having served two terms on a board of a financially strapped district providing ambulance service, I have a deep understanding of the position the board is in. I also understand the district needs to do some work to ensure the long-term financial health of the agency. That being said, my review of the financials lead me to, to the opinion that the draconian cuts presented to the budget committee are an unwarranted slap in the face to the hardworking employees at Western Lane Ambulance. At a minimum, the action is a blow to morale. If implemented, will jeopardize the recruitment, retention of qualified paramedics for this community. Um, and to speak towards the, uh, if I have a little bit of time left, the PERS debt that so many of us see on our rolls currently um, has been there for the last three to four years by a change in the Government Accountability Standards Board requirement and listing uh, long-term unfunded liability uh, that are paid over a long period of time. And so to look at that as, as the district being in debt at the moment in time, uh, I think is, is a lack of, of depth of understanding of public financing, especially as it relates to uh, Oregon's unique challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And I, I see MJ there. Do we have audio with you? MJ Church. I can see you trying. You're not muted. I think MJ, if you want to submit your comments, you, you can do that. I'm, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to hear your comments. Chief, I do believe that MJ has one of the letters in the correspondence file. He does, yeah. Okay. We'll go on to our uh, sixth uh, public comment is from Vanessa Buss. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I'm uh, reading a message uh, on behalf of Dr. Foster. Um, he is our medical director of our emergency department, also chief of staff at Peace Harbor Medical Center. I am deeply concerned about some of the proposed changes of staffing of our Western Lane Emergency Ambulance District. The current staff plan has worked well and has provided an excellent level of care to our community. There are many critical patients that Western Lane Ambulance not only brings into the ED, but also transfers over to River Bend or other higher levels of care. There are several things that can happen during a long transport between emergency departments or intensive care units, and we need these highly trained and qualified personnel to ensure the safety of our patients. As a provider for multiple hospitals, I can truthfully state that the paramedics that staff Western Lane Ambulance District, District all operate at a very high level. We in the ED count on them every day to assist us in providing the best possible care to our community. Thank you for carefully analyzing any changes to staffing or their operations and the retention of these employees to ensure our community uh, continues to receive the highest level of care. And I'd like to also just make one quick comment um, and to piggyback on everyone else's. I've been born and raised in Florence and believe in a, in a small community and the things and opportunities that we have to offer to those that live here. And I think we'd do, be doing ourselves a very huge disservice in disbanding or repurposing our local uh, EMS that we currently have 
Um, they provide lots of support to our community. They participate in our community. And we may lose those folks that are living and raising families here if we don't realize what they're contributing to our community as a whole. And um, I hope you really, really think deeply and thoughtfully about that transition. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, seventh public comment uh, and last on our list is uh, Derek Mullins. Uh, that is supposed to be for Corey Miner. Uh, oh. Okay, we can change that to Corey Miner. Great, Corey Miner, 1090 Fairway in Eugene. As you've heard by several of the other individuals here, but it's easy to forget, Florence and Western Lane, uh, Western Lane County is in a unique place. For appropriate definitive care, you have longer than normal transport times that go beyond what patients typically can stand under normal paramedic care in normal urban settings. Yes, you have fiscal responsibility to taxpayers, but you also have a responsibility to the lives of your families and neighbors, and what is a life worth? Florence and Western Lane County has some of the very best pre-hospital medical coverage of anywhere in the state, and I have trained medics up and down this entire state. Western Lane Ambulance District is a breeding ground for competent, well-trained, thorough, and compassionate medics. I know most of them, and I've had the pleasure to train many of them, and I can say unequivocally, Western Lane currently receives the very best candidates Oregon has to offer. That will not be the same moving forward if you make these cuts, and that has been shown in many other communities who've made these decisions. In all the medical fields, the number one objective, nursing, paramedic, physician, the number one objective is to do no harm. If you make decisions that decimate the crews, absolutely the net result will be harm to the citizens of Florence and Western Lane County. Make no mistake, your husbands, wives, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, friends, and neighbors will not be afforded the level of care they deserve. You need to have a balanced budget, yes. However, you need to take the decimation of the crews off the table. There are many other avenues of support, revenue generation, and efficiency in expenses. The community can't afford for you to be short-sighted in this. It's your responsibility and the very lives of the community are counting on you. You have to take into consideration the location of Florence, the location that Western Lane County has, and where medical care is. If you change the level of care based on decimating these crews, you're gonna wind up in a situation where lives are endangered by not being able to get to the medical, the medical care that they need, the definitive medical care that they need in a timely fashion. And that's very critical. You, Western Lane and Florence by far has some of the absolute best pre-hospital medical cover of anywhere in the Western United States. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. So, MJ, did you get your audio working? MJ Church. Now it looks like her video froze. Well, I want to thank everyone for their uh, public comments. They are much appreciated. I, I'm glad that you uh, could participate in our board this meeting. Is Terry, this is Terry Tomney. I sent in a request to talk and haven't been called. Uh, I don't have your name on the list, Terry. Well, it, it was there and I was confirmed that I was going to talk. Right. And Terry, you, uh, you asked to be uh, a speaker at the budget committee meeting. And I emailed you back asking if you meant the budget committee meeting or the board meeting and I didn't hear back from you. So um, if we, we do have time, uh, chief and board, yeah. if you would like to let Terry speak. Terry, do you want to well, speak to um, this meeting? Okay, thanks. Yes, I do. Uh, I'd like to thank the opportunity to address the board tonight. I think I personally know several of the current board members and at least one of the paramedics. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Terry Tomney. I'm a retired Air Force and industry test pilot and executive, and I've been in, in uh, retired in Florence for four years. So why am I commenting tonight? Well, 
my interest came after reading the recent article in the newspaper about the difficulties you're having in adopting the ambulance district budget. I was interested enough to ask some questions and obtain some data. <clears throat> and I can relate to the problems you seem to be having. So I'd like to make a few comments, but also ask a few questions. But before I go any further, let me say that my comments in no way take away from the dedication and talent of the professional employees in the ambulance district. I've heard nothing but wonderful reports about the great service we have. Also, just prior to my 71st birthday, I don't want to tick off any people who may be loading my carcass into an ambulance someday. Uh, my concerns stem around being able to establish a budget that is fair to both the employees and the taxpayers who are paying for a lot of this, and to remind the board that us taxpayers are counting on you to do this. I have personal experience on, the, on several boards of directors where the board members turned over frequently and very closely and, and were very personally, per, personally close to all the employees, and the salaries and benefits gradually went out of control. And it was a very difficult task to take a hard look at the manning structure and the duties and the compensation, including benefits, and make sure they were all fair and were in line with other equivalent organizations. Frequently, they were hugely inflated and very difficult decisions needed to be taken. So I'll be honest and tell you that I'm not an expert on the ambulance district operations, and that although I've been able to collect a lot of information quickly, I've not had the time to review and digest it all, but I have seen enough to really raise some concerns. I would ask that the board um, take a serious look at the following. One is the manning structure, the position des descriptions, and the duties to make sure that we have the right number of people with the right qualifications and experience. Second, take a hard look at the compensation that these people are receiving to include not only base pay, but overtime policy and benefits. At first look, the current salaries and overtime appear to be significantly higher than equivalent districts. And comparing that to the average income in the community, they appear to have quite a good deal. The overtime costs and policies also raise questions and concerns. Is the overtime policy set up to create an efficient organization or is it set up at the convenience of the employees to maximize income? Just asking. The benefits, without a doubt, the benefits, health, vacation, cell phones, gym memberships, et cetera, appear to be a very sweet deal and has to be expensive. Very few companies now offer this kind of compensation. Bottom Jerry, line. Jerry, you're over. That's the three minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. MJ, last chance. Did you get your... Okay. Uh, again, thank you for everybody for participating. We do appreciate the comments. We're now going to move to a presentation on the uh, Sayusla Valley Fire and Rescue and Western Lane Ambulance District annual audits. Uh, the directors will have the opportunity to comment or ask questions at the end, but I'm sure that we can um, handle questions during as well. So that is Mark Hausen. I saw you there earlier. Keith? Yes? I just wanted to, before we move on to Akuli, I just want to say one thing. For everyone who did come to give public comment, and I think you mentioned at the beginning, but I just want to reiterate that for anyone who didn't get to finish their statement or anyone who didn't get to speak, it make sure that it's submitted either as an email or a writing so that it can be included in the public comment part so that it is a it is available to the public. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Kathy, I heard you for a minute there while Ned was speaking, but now I see you're muted again. If you go up to the upper right hand corner, there's a little blue box, Mark. I can unmute him. You can unmute him. It's not accepting that.
I think I just unmuted myself. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being patient. This is still a new process for us. Oh, it is not. <laughs> well, that's my excuse and I'm st sticking with it. Can you hear Mark now? Yes. Yes. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dina for all her help um, <clears throat> and her staff. And when you look at the report, the very first thing you need to look at is the auditor's opinion. And that's on page three. And we gave an unqualified opinion, which is the best that we can give. So that's really a good start. Mark, hey, Chief. excuse me, are you, are you starting with the Sayusla Valley audit? Or yes. Thank you. Sayusla Valley? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then also, if you go to uh, page 49, which is our report to the state, uh, we state that the compliance was substantially uh, correct. So that's good. So then, so basically what we're saying is the report is uh, we found no real problems with it. Uh, what you may look at is if you compare the Sayusla Valley Fire Department with the ambulance, you'll see a difference in uh, presentation. In the uh, Sayusla, we're uh, required by the government accounting standards to have actually two sets of statements, uh, the, the GASB statements and the fund statements. And you won't find that in the Western ambulance because it's considered a proprietary uh, uh, entity, so it has to follow the, the GASBs. So there's a difference between those two uh, reports. Uh, if you look at what we did, we looked, most of your income comes from property taxes. 75% comes from the property taxes. We, we contacted uh, both of the uh, counties got their statements of tax collections for the year and got their uh, distribution percentages and applied it to these schedules and compared with what we came up with, what is on the board. And it's uh, no substantial differences. We also confirmed directly with the bank, the bank state, the bank balances. We uh, concurred with the, uh, your attorney and had he had no uh, litigation to re to report to us, uh, so we found basically nothing that uh, really stands out. Uh, one thing that I would suggest is that you have a quite a substantial amount of cash, and you and it's my understanding that if you make a twenty five thousand dollar uh, contribution to your unfunded pension liability, the estate will match that. So that's one thing you may consider. The other thing to consider is that most of the uh, municipals that I work with use uh, the local government investment pool, which pays a higher rent, is quite a bit significantly higher rent interest rate than do the banks. Uh, there may be reasons why you don't do that, but you should consider it. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Kathy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, Ron, Kathy did most of the testing on, on the payroll and on uh, the cash disbursements. And the prior auditor had quite a number of comments in his management letter uh, about how well uh, the district was responding to this. And so Kathy has some comments that what she uh... Actually, I thought that everything had really improved from what uh, the previous auditor had found. Um, it 
it appears that systems have been put into place to make sure documentation is available, accessible, and um, all entries are correct and there's a lot of checks and balances. So I, I think I found a couple of discrepancies with uh, at the end of the year, just what should have been accrued as a payable and what wasn't. It was very minor though. Uh, and I think I spoke with Dina about all of that. Um, but everything, everything seemed to check out as far as I could see. And the same with payroll, um, making sure that it was all balanced out and reported correctly and everyone paid correctly. Um, so I didn't find any problems with any of that. The one thing I, uh, I did hear one of the uh, uh, speakers they had uh, prior to me, made the comment that the pension liability isn't shown on the statements, well, it is shown. Statement of net position shows that the net pension liability is, is a million three twenty four. Uh, those numbers are given to us by PERS. Uh, their actuary goes through and makes a number of estimates and comes out with their basically their best estimate of what the unfunded liability is. Uh, we don't have any control over that. That's just given to us. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that the pension liability was shown. It's on shown in page 11. Are there any questions? Okay, let's, let's go to Western. Uh, the same thing holds true with Western about the auditor's opinion. The auditor's opinion is unqualified. And we found that uh, uh, you were in substantial compliance with uh, state regulations. So we had no comments on that. Uh, the, really the, uh, the biggest change I think is if you look at the, uh, the budget numbers. Uh, they're they're pretty consistent. You didn't uh, you didn't spend as much money as he budgeted by quite a bit. Uh, you might review that. Uh, other than that, the the uh, uh, revenues seem to be pretty much in line with what you would expect. Uh, we did the same thing with property taxes. We got the reports from the two counties uh, and their percentage of distribution and calculate out what uh, your tax receipts would have been. And we compared that with what you actually booked and we found no significant differences. Uh, again, Kathy looked at uh, payroll. We did testing on the payroll. We confirmed the bank balances. We looked at uh, uh, just the, the uh, voucher payments, the cash distributions. And again, she had no significant comments about that. And so that's improved greatly from what your uh, prior mm -hmm. auditors listed. Um, so basically it, it was a pretty clean audit. I mean, we don't really have any, any real concerns right now. Any questions? I wondered, uh, this is Director Yesney, I just, I have two. One is, um, were there any significant adjustments to the financial statements, um, correcting anything in particular? And second, can you comment on any, um, a letter of recommendations or anything you might have? <coughs> um, the adjustments that we made are mostly for depreciation. That was the largest one. Um, <clears throat> and that was that schedule was calculated by the uh, contractor that you hired from Portland, the CPA. We audited that uh, and found no real adjustments to it. Uh, as far as uh, recommendations, um, I, I think that the, the biggest thing that you've done is hired Dina. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems like I got things pretty well squared away and 
and I understand she hasn't been there for four years. I expect nothing. Do you have any comments, Kathy? Um, no, I just uh, I second that. <coughs> I think Dina's doing a very good job, and she's really worked hard and straightened out a lot of issues that were there in the past. I have a question. Sure. Um, looking at uh, the statement of net position as of June 30th, 2019, and um, you have uh, listed, <clears throat> there's, um, excuse me, just one second, get the right page here. Um, there's something that was uh, confusing to me about a schedule of uh, future uh, liabilities, both on the asset and liability side. Do you have a schedule for those? In terms so, of are pension? you talking about the pension liabilities? I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those numbers are are given to us from the, uh, like I say, from FERS, and there's a number of schedules back uh, yes. on the pension uh, plans that we. have uh, provided and I think if you if you review those you'll see where the numbers <coughs> come from like on uh, page 25 there's a there's a summary of the deferred outflow and inflows of resources okay so um, were you provided those numbers or did you come up with those no numbers? we're provided those numbers okay so did we use 2016 data or 2017 data um, 2017. Okay, because I, I got the impression we were using 2016. Um, that was probably from last year. Right, so our, our unfunded liability is like 2.8 million, 2.9 million. And I was just looking at this schedule, it looks like you've got like a million dollars on one side of the equation. I'm just trying to figure out what the detail right, is. Right, right. Well, part of the reason is be, because the numbers that PERS gives us are old. Oh, I agree. They're yeah. not current numbers. <laughs> and so you have made contributions since the date of this, uh, this report, which is the actuarial date is, two, is December 16th. Uh, and it's, it's rolled forward to the measurement date, which is June 30th, 2018. So that's where the asset, the deferred uh, inflows comes from, deferred outflows. That comes from that. And there's also in, in that, if you, the uh, PERS gives us what's called a GASB 68 statement. And there's a number of things that happen in that statement. It's not just the payments, it's the changes of assumptions that happen during the year. Uh, for example, a couple, the last couple of years, PERS has changed the rate that they think they're gonna make on their money. Because before they were using 7.5% and they were actually making less than 6%. So that, that increased the unfunded liability a lot. And now they've, they've reduced that to 7.2%. And first thinks that that has uh, resulted in increasing the unfunded liability by $2 billion. So how is a deferred, how is a, de a deferral of pension? An it's gonna, it'll, it'll be reversed in the future years. I understand, but how is it an asset? Because you've already paid, paid you already made payments on it. Okay. It hasn't been reflected in the, in the PERS calculation. I understand, so is the difference between the two our unfunded actuarial liability? Yes, because they take that in consideration when they're they're calculating the liability. Stand. So we've made payments to PERS, but we owe money to PERS. Well, you've made payments, but you have you've been making them at a rate that was not right. See? Because you're making it based on you're earning seven points and three quarters percent when PERS is actually only making six percent. Right. So, so that's that what's built up that unfunded liability. Right. So is it fair to say that we owe more than what's indicated on this? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. How would you characterize it? 
Well, I, it's his best guess that the actuaries can come up with. I mean, I have I don't have any way of of uh, going back and proving it out. Okay, so the 2017 report from Milliman is that the best, most recent report we have? Well, the one I have is is, is uh, the measurement date is June 30th, 2018. That's the one we used. Okay. The 17 was a prior year. Right. So what does the 2018 one say? Well, just with the numbers that, I, that are on the statement. Right. So what's the unfunded actuarial liability? Do you have that at the end or? Uh, let's see. Yes. Okay. For a Western uh, ambulance, it's the 2212000 Okay. Thank you. And they show what, and also if you look at the statement, you'll see that PERS gives us what happens if they made less than 1% less, and what happens if they made 1% more than the 7.2. And so those figures are in the report also. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Sure, thank you. And no further questions for the audit? Okay. Uh, do we have to approve the audits? Yes. Okay, so we'll need a motion to approve in a second uh, of the uh, individual agencies' audits. Um, first, we'll go with Western oh, Lane. Is that Western Lane? question? Oh, you got to go Western Lane first? Yeah, Western Lane and the sister first. So I need a motion and a second. Uh, this is Director Yesney, and I'll make a motion to approve the audit. Director Murphy makes a second. Is there any discussion? Mary, can you do a roll call vote? Director Yesney? Yes. Director Russell? Yes. Director Murphy? Yes. Director Farnsworth? Yes. Director Webb? Yes. So now for Sciosla Valley Fire and Rescue, I'd like a motion and a second to approve the annual audit. It's I think Mr. Jim. Jim, please. This, okay. I second. I second the uh, motion that was made. Did we get who made the motion? Ned. I, Director Hicks. It was Ned. Director Hicks. Okay, great. Any discussion? Mary, can you do a roll call vote? Director Green? Yes. Director Hickson? Yes. Director Burns? Yes. Director Plesey and Director Ye State? Yes. Okay, thank you. What about Director Spade? Mary, did you call Director Spade? Yes, I did. He's muted. Then how did you hear it? <laughs> Sammy, did you vote in favor of approving the audit? It's oh, not thank muted. You. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. We're now going to move on to uh, approving the minutes from the April 23rd joint board meeting. So we'll need a motion and a second for approval of the minutes, and we'll follow that up with a roll call vote. We'll start again with Western Lane Ambulance District. I move to approve the minutes. That was Mike Webb. Yes. Cindy Russell seconded. Um, Director. Oh, just leave. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. Director Yesney. Yes. Director Russell. Yes. Director Murphy. Yes. Director Farnsworth? Yes. And Director Webb? Yes. So for Sayusla Valley Fire and Rescue, I need a motion and a second. Move to approve the minutes from April 23rd. I was wrong, Green. Yes. Was there a second? Second, Maybe. Jim Polisi. Jim Polisi seconds. Mary. Director Green. Yes. Director Hickson. Sorry. Yes. Director Burns. Yes. Director Plesey. Yes. 
And Director Spade. Yes. Thank you. Now for a Western Lane Fire and EMS story. Uh, motion and a second. I'll make a I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for Western Lane Fire and EMS Authority. Ned Hickson. Second. Director Farnsworth seconded. Mary. Director Green. Yes. Director Hickson. Yes. Director Yesney. Yes. And Director Farnsworth. Yes. Thank you. We'll now go to review of the monthly financials. Dina. Okay. So we're 10 months into the fiscal year. We should expect to have expenses tracking at about 84%. Uh, for Welfia, we, I submitted a mobile crisis response program invoice. It's the second invoice that uh, we have sent to Lane County and we have been reimbursed $30,468 dollars recently. So that brings our total reimbursements for the mobile crisis response program to $73,583. For Sayusla Valley Fire and Rescue, uh, we are still working on a another reimbursement request for the SAFER grant and S-A-F-E-R stands for Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response. And this invoice will be for $102,008. And this reimburses the district for the recruitment and retention coordinators wages and benefits for October 2019 through December 2019, as well as new recruit physicals, turnout gear that was distributed over the course of five past academies. Uh, line item 6200 on the Sayusla Valley budget versus actual report shows the recruitment expense over budget by quite a bit. And this mm -hmm. is due to having uh, Swiss Home Deadwood responders having to take physicals for the SAFER grant to get their gear reimbursed by FEMA. Uh, as stated about the cost of these physicals will be reimbursed. Also, station facility expenses for Sayusla Valley are tracking high, but to date, operation expenses is under budget uh, as a whole at 68.17%. For Western Lane, a question came up during the budget committee meeting asking where the ground emergency medical transport income was. It had been deposited into a Medicaid line item 4020 and so I made a new account to have it now visible. So it does show up on the, the financials as the GEMT income. And in addition, Western Lane received $42,054 from the Public Health and Emergency Relief Fund, which was put into miscellaneous revenue line item 4280. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey, Dina, I have a quick question on the Western Lane balance sheet. Okay. Uh, we have we have net pension liabilities shown on the internal balance sheet for the first time that I've seen. Just curious, why is it shown as a current liability? Is it something that's due and payable now? And if we were to pay this off, would it go away? So one thing that I neglected to mention was that the auditor gave me some journal entries uh, from uh, right after the audit was done and I entered them and they are showing up on these financials. However, we did have a meeting with the auditor today with Director Yesney and come to find out that some of these journal entries I, were, I was given have been revised. So in answer to your question, I am looking for the exact line item you're referring to. You're 2150. 2150. 2150. I'm pulling that up right now. So it's showing as a current liability, which I don't think it's something that we could pay right now and make go away, or do I think they're calling it right now? That's why I'm curious as to why it's showing as due and payable this year. Well, I, I was looking this up uh, in terms of the verbiage and perhaps Director Yesney can help us, but there's a whole discussion you can look up on 
how this should be separated in your balance sheet. Um, we have three new lines this month. We have line 1340, which is deferred outflow of resources, and we have lines 2150, net pension liability and deferred inflow of resources. And I really think we need more detail about what those are. And other, other organizations that have this have this separate because you can look at them as future, callable. Well, since we just had this meeting today, we've made a lot of corrections to the Western Line Ambulance balance sheet, which mm -hmm. includes these amounts. So I think if you bear with me, we can uh, report uh, at next month's board meeting with more accurate numbers. Yeah, I just would like to know why it's showing as a current liability. To me, it's something that's a long-term liability. <laughs> um, if, and it's something that we can't satisfy. I mean, if we wrote a check to PERS, for $2.1 million, it's still going to be there. So. I will be happy to, uh, I just ran these adjusted journal, these revised journal entries today. I would be happy to send you a fresh set of financials tomorrow for your review. Okay. If you can also put some detail how those lines were calculated, that would be helpful. Well, that's up to the auditor because these are the numbers I get from the auditor. Okay. So as near as we know, um, I'm not sure what the two line items are, the net pension liability and then the deferred inflow of resources. I'm confused as to right. what. Right, and like I said, those numbers are probably gone now. Oh, are so, they? Okay. Um, right. Please just let me send you a revised set of financials and we can go from there. Okay. Dina, Dina, I have a question on the uh, mobile intervention, the crisis uh, reimbursement. Is that per call or is that just a set amount that they get per, per month or per quarter? So the invoice that I send to Lane County to reimburse for the mobile crisis response program includes the, the uh, payroll for the, the stipends for the, the, the team that are responding to these calls and for Lori Severance's wages to administer the program, as well as um, I believe you will see on the Wilfia budget versus actual report, you do have a line item for income and the expenses are listed in they may be uh, combined uh, and collapsed, so there's not a great detail, but it includes like uh, printing for or literature, uh, training for the staff, and the expenses that just go into the program. So the per call is not, so if they had one call, it's versus 30 calls, it's no different. No, it's just, it's, it's okay. just the expenses that are going in to uh, operate the program. To maintain it. Thank you. Well, no, no, we we get each they get a stipend for when they run calls, so that would change month to month. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then we get ten percent of the budgeted amount for overhead, just for administering the, the program, which is about twenty five thousand, I think. Yep. Okay. Year. Thank you. Do we have any idea when we'll get the remainder of the MIH payment? Uh, I have signed that agreement and sent it back to Peace Harbor. Um, I would assume, oh, you're talking about, you're not talking about going forward, you're talking about in the past? Yeah, I, I think I think we're owed money for this fiscal year, which ends in two months, and should may have paid that to us in January. Well, they work on a calendar year, so I think that may be where the difference is. So they well, gave us, I believe they gave us 100,000, it was just 50,000 one year, one fiscal year, and 50,000 the next fiscal year. Is that right, Dina? Uh, yes. Right. right, but are, are we not in their new fiscal year? Right, coming up, they're going to do um, the agreement is for a payment of 250000 for two years. It should be a single payment. Okay, so um, is that 50000 that's shown right here on our statement as budgeted? I mean, we didn't get anything at the start of their fiscal year. So I mean, are, are we going to get that fifty thousand or or not? How do they do the MIH? Do we invoice them, Dina, or do they just? 
Well, the the MI maybe Matt, can you chime in? I believe that we've already received the income for the first part of it, and we're waiting for the contract to go through for the two years, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And what we have done already is, like Chief had mentioned, has already signed the document. We're waiting for it to turn around. Whether we get some of that money this year because they're on a calendar year versus us on a fiscal year is not yet to be determined. Okay, so um, the two hundred fifty thousand. What period of time is that for? Over two years. Okay, so is it 2021 and 2022 with the remainder for 2020? Is I would have to believe when we signed the contract, it would go from the date of where we signed the contract to two years after that. Okay, I understand. But what I'm wondering is, aren't we owed $50,000 for current operations regardless? I don't believe so. The but I, check the data. Right. I think that we've already been paid for the first part of the program to start it up, get well, it going. We'd have to refer back to the data to make sure we answer that question appropriately. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is because we have 50,000 receivable in our budget and we've not received that, that money. So my assumption is because we're talking about a calendar year for the hospital, that their calendar year started in January, we should have received 50,000 then for the remainder of our fiscal year, which ends June 30th. So we may arrive at June 30th without a payment for the six months that we operated the program. So we just need clarity on that. Yeah. Do you remember when last time we received a payment from Peace Harbor for that, Dina? I can look it up. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, any other financial questions? Okay. We have no old business, new business. I have two items for Sayosa Valley Fire and Rescue. The first, I just wanted to get some feedback from the directors on our electronic reader board. Uh, we received a lot of, recently received a lot of requests to place uh, messages on our reader board. And from what I can tell, we don't have a written policy. Uh, we do have an unofficial, unwritten policy. And that's that there cannot be any political messages, no personal messages from the public, and no private business messages. And some examples of what we have put on, on there uh, we recently posted a birthday notice for a retired SVFR firefighter. Uh, we put a notice from the electric company informing citizens who to contact if they need financial support during the, the pandemic. Uh, we put up a message from the PTA recognizing teachers. And in the past, we've posted messages from the city for like their, their hazardous materials cleanup. And all messages are approved by a chief officer, should be approved by a chief officer. But um, anything from the board that you think that we should allow or should not allow, um, any comment? My plan is to come up with a written policy for approval. Um, just some input for what you'd like to see in there, if anything different than what I just said. Uh, Chief, this is Jim Polisi. Yes. Okay, I, I would like to comment on that. The, uh, the message board is a public information tool. And it should be broadcasting not just fire and life safety messages, but it also should be doing EMS. There should be messages about how to learn CPR, uh, you know, stroke awareness, all different types of uh, fire and EMS public safety messages. Birthdays are great. Don't get me wrong, I think it's wonderful. I hope we all have many birthdays, but I would rather see that message board being run 24 seven with true public information messages about where to go for this, how to do that, those kinds of uh, messages. And I, I welcome any feedback from other directors. Sure. I'll just piggyback on that. This is Ned. I'll just piggyback on that and say, I, you know, I agree to with Jim on that. Um, but I also think that anything that we can put on there that is public information oriented, whether it's from the city of Florence or 
uh, you know, there's a tree limb pickup or there's, uh, you know, get all of your chemicals together and bring them to the waste site or anything that is going to benefit the public in terms of educating them about opportunities that they have to stay safe or get rid of chemicals that they don't need or that the city needs to get out to people. I, you know, I'd like to see us work in conjunction with other local agencies as well and not just specific to fire and EMS is the only thing I would add to that. Sure. Okay. Okay, I'll throw my hat in there. I agree with Ned totally, Chief, but I get tired of a little bit of the um, happy birthdays, you know, this person is a hero, that type of thing. Uh, I believe in the hazardous waste material cleanup, as Ned indicated, uh, stroke prevention, as uh, Jim said, but you have to draw the line someplace. And if you do one, you have to do it all. Correct. Any other comments? Okay, those are, we'll work up a policy and um, have it approved by the board. So the next item for the SVFR board was um, concerning our switch to a 24 hour staffing. We came across a temporary issue, which I want to get approval for the solution that I came up with. And it does impact our current collective bargaining agreement, the CBA, the union contract. So we'll require a signed MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding. And we'll develop that once the board gives me direction. So since the staffing model provides for 24 seven coverage, we have to decide what we want to do, if anything, for those firefighters who work on an approved holiday. When they are working a 40 hour work week, they got the day off with pay. Um, so we have to decide if we want to do anything for those, uh, those firefighters that are on a 24 hour shift. In, in my experience, I've seen agencies provide a specific number of vacation hours at the beginning of the year. Um, so January 1st, they, they, they accrue an extra 80 hours of vacation for the year. And that's in lieu of working any holiday um, that year. Everybody gets the same amount, whether or not you're scheduled for a holiday that year or not. I also had a district that paid just an annual bonus at the end of the year. Again, same amount for every firefighter. Didn't matter wh whether they were scheduled for that holiday or not. So this is something we'll have to bargain with the union if we decide to go to a permanent 24 hour staffing. But in the meantime, I have discussed it with the union and they're willing to accept um, eight hours of accrued vacation time give, being given to those firefighters who work one of the approved holidays. And those holidays are listed in the uh, collective bargaining agreement. So in the past, this would apply to Memorial Day this past week. And then possibly if we haven't come up to agreement, but this would apply to July 4th. Um, I'm hoping that we would have something in place something permanent in place by Labor Day. So I would like a motion and a second to approve the awarding of eight hours of crude vacation time to each firefighter that's working an approved holiday. So moved. This is Alan Burns. Burns. Second by Sam Spade. Second. So discussion. I have a question. Uh, sure. Excuse me, Ron Green here. Do we have any idea are there any peer districts that have the same schedule? And do we have an idea as to what is done as maybe as a common practice or best practice? Yeah, yeah, I do have that data. I can get that for you. I don't have it right here, Ron, but um, it, it, a lot of it is what I just said, but, but I think every district does a little bit different. Um, I don't think any district wants to pay time and a half for, for those holidays. Yeah. I mean, I'm in favor of the recommendation, but I just always curious to know if we're doing something even as, as small as this may be uh, from a cost standpoint that is out of line with our peers. So Yeah, no, I can, I'll get you that info. Okay. Any further discussion? I just, I like the idea of uh, the accrued eight hours uh, for those who work the holidays. It's easy to keep track of because you just have to look back and see who worked when. It seems fair rather than just a blanket payment to everybody, regardless of whether they worked it or not. Mm -hmm. like to the people who actually have to work those shifts rewarded for that because we all appreciate it so that seems like a fair way to do it okay 
Any other comments? Mary, roll call for SCFR. Director Green. Approve. Director Hickson. Approve. Director Burns. Yes. Director Polisi. Approve. Director Spade. Yes. So thank you, everybody. We'll go on to staff reports now. Uh, Chief reports. Uh, just update on COVID-19. We are receiving some direction for uh, phase one and phase two reopening procedures. Um, I think you've probably all seen the influx of people into our community. Uh, we're still being very cautious. The EOC is still active, the Emergency Operations Center uh, for Western Lane is still active. Um, like I said, we're being very cautious. I wouldn't be surprised to see an increase in, in COVID-19 cases. Uh, we still don't have a confirmed case in Florence that we are aware of. Um, the state has finally started releasing that information by zip code, which I think is a good move. And um, I, I wish they would have started with that. Um, so we are still um, winding, well, we're winding things down, um, but still cautious, because um, I think that we probably will see a, a few more cases uh, appearing. And at the uh, last Peace Harbor Community Board meeting, there was a, um, a fantastic recognition of our MIH paramedic, w Wendy. And I saw that, Matt. I don't know if you were going to talk about that. I'm just going to steal your thunder here. But um, she caught a medication error for, for one of uh, her patients. And I thought it was uh, very nice of Peace Harbor to recognize her efforts. And um, and that's just one of many examples I think that we could pick for, for that program, uh, why it's so important to our community. So uh, congratulations to Wendy for, for that recognition. And speaking of recognition, we've been working very hard to um, provide some recognition to our employees. You know, we did have to cancel our annual banquet uh, because of the pandemic. Um, so we've been doing things like we provided burritos to all three ships uh, this past month. Uh, we had some gifts uh, during EMS week. Uh, we did have some gifts that we had purchased that we were going to give out to the banquet. Uh, flashlights for, for the firefighters and then a variety of gifts for, for uh, the Western Lane employees. Uh, so we are working very hard and I appreciate all the directors that, that have pitched in and, and, and helped out with uh, some of the meals. It's much appreciated. There is a, a thank you letter in our correspondence for that. So I, I know all the employees are very thankful as well for, for um, everything the directors have been doing for them. So that's, that's uh, my report. Matt, take us through operations. Thanks, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> going over the April call volumes in EMS, again, the trend seems to be that our transports go down just a little bit and our no patient 911 responses are going up, and I think that's directly related to the COVID environment that we're in. If you look at the April summary, that we're plus three in transports, plus 15 in transfers, again, if we're in a facility transfers, and plus 34 for 911, no transports. For overall call volume, we were 54 above last year. And if you look at the COVID breakdown, you asked me to continue it from March 20th to April 20th. If you look at the percentages, that's looking at 2020 versus 2019, we're 11% less on transports, 53% increase on public assists, 63% increase on ALS per transfers, which is advanced life support transfers, 10% increase on basic life support transfers, and 33% increase on critical care transports. On the fire, any questions on EMS call volume for month of April and the COVID breakdown? Matt, what is it? You have second month also. Is that April or is that March and April you're doing or? It's, I'm sorry, I didn't change it. It's March 20th through April 20, or May 20th on the three year comparison. Is that what you're asking about? Wait, after you have first month and second month in the last with the percentage difference. Yes, that is March 20th through April 20th, or May 20th. Okay, thank you. And it's the three years in comparison in that data. I have a, Mr. House, I, this is Alan Burns. I have a question. Yes, sir. 
Sir, um, what do you mean by COVID breakdown? Uh, on Mar in the March board meeting, it was asked, uh, how are we being impacted with the coronavirus? So we're looking at the data over the last, since March 20th, when the government declared a stay at home order, how is it affecting our call volume? And so that's from March 20th through May 20th is that breakdown over the last three years, 2018, 2019, 2020, in comparison of what we've done over those last three years. Thank you. The reason why I wanted you to explain it, if I was some general person watching this right now, I'd be thinking you have all these COVID patients. Fair, sorry. No other questions on EMS? I just have one question. Um, how are you guys set for PPE? We're good. We continue to have access to the Lane County Emergency Operations Center if we need some. The vendors, they say, have opened up for the public supply chain, but we have not seen that yet. So we're continuing to go through our Lane County Emergency Operations Center to get equipment. We currently have some in reserve at our logistics station, and we were ahead of the game and bought the N95 respirator industrials where we can replace filters, Tyvek suits, which are a little bit more expensive, but they're reusable, so we get more life out of them. Our burn rate is high, but we're, I think we're managing it pretty well, even considering. Okay, thank you. Hey, Matt, I've got a yes. quick question regarding uh, practices. We pay for gym memberships and we pay for some cell phone reimbursement. Why the cell phone? Is it, is it their specific purpose of what we're doing there? The captains and the training officer are the ones that get stipend because of the anticipated higher use to it. The gym membership has been something that we've had with the district, well, to be honest with you, as long as I've been here for 23 years, even when the gym was off 15th Street, and that is to ensure that our employees are in good shape and ready for response. And all of this is preventative care so that if somebody injures their back, it's a lot more expensive for a safe claim than it is actually to do preventative care and gym maintenance. Uh, since we purchased the, uh, the Stryker uh, automatic uh, gurneys, the ones that raise up on their own, I don't know what that was, 12 years ago or so. Have we had a back injury related to lifting a patient into the vehicles? Not a time loss back injury, no. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. And Matt, yeah. aren't the cell phones also used that if they're out of, the, for them to be able to call into the physician in the ER? Correct. And where the captain's workload is a little bit different, all of our employees, we have the way modern technology has increased that we have applications that we use to do a cardiac uh, activation with river band or a stroke activation through river band. So a lot of technology has moved that direction. The first phase was because of the captain's workload and requiring them to use it more often. That was where we're at to stipend them. So yeah. yes. Patient care. Patient care, yes. I've got one last question for you. The, the fire district just talked about what we do or what they do when somebody works a holiday. Does Western Lane have anything similar? It was, and I can get this more dialed in, but from what I recall in the history of it is why are recruits of our vacation hours are what they are is because it was factored into it. And that's going off the top of my head and trying to remember back. We've never been for any holiday reimbursed for anything. And that's where I think that it was factored into our accruals and that's where the accruals may have been elevated. Okay. Chief House. Yes, sir. I think we ought to entertain and look at that we have a satellite phone in each ambulance that is on duty in case our radios go down or cell phone towers go down and we're able to communicate with the medical facilities? We do have two satellite phones in the area that we have access to for the worst case scenario to net disasters. And that's usually where they would come into play. Can you contact them by radio as well? That I'd have to follow up on that one, Chief. I'm still catching up on some of the workload. Sure. Chief House. But I think uh, in our Chief House, yes, sir. Chief House, can you hear me? It, it, it's Jim Polisi. Does Fire have access to those satellites, or is it just uh, EMS? No, both do. Okay, great. Thank you. We also have 
the gets cards that all the captains have the gets cards which is a way of we become in the front of the line in the cell service which director right. police you know that but yeah. for those that may not understand it worst case scenario disaster hits we use our cell phones who the hundred that may have been in the line before we bumped them out we become number one because of emergency access Okay, uh, going on, continuing on with call volumes, we had one structure fire in April. I would consider this a great save. It was an attached garage. We were able to put it out before any extension and nothing went into the two-story structure, roughly $400,000 able to save. Great response. We had 15 personnel on scene. Uh, EMS call volume is again, is 25, 25 calls above last year, but that's expected yeah. because we're running more EMS calls. Uh, general services, which is expected to have a decline because of we're not doing more door-to-door -door uh, responses, that's down by four. Any other questions on call responses for? Yes, fire? yes. Uh, Chief House on the rescue EMS, are those vehicle extrications in conjunction with safety support for the yes, EMS personnel? Okay, yes, good. Thank you. you feel like I can break it down to where it's more vehicle related collisions no. in the MS, but <clears throat> it's, it, as long as that the uh, two agencies are supporting one another. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to briefly go over the operations report. I realize that we've all been involved with this stuff. If you have any questions, of course, feel free. Westerland Ambulance has uh, uh, renewed their annual and ambulance cert recertification that's completed. We're waiting from the service license from the Oregon Health Authority. We ran into a glitch because when we changed the addresses, we didn't notify CLIA, which is the governing body for laboratory waivers. And it's we're in compliance with it. We just don't have the correct certification for it. But I screenshotted it and sent it, and the Oregon Health Authority has approved it. Uh, training report, we continue to do really good things actually with yeah. being in lockdown, but are we in the fire sector, we are doing more company evolutions training, more integrated, where we're seeing kind of like special operation teams and developing it. It's been good. We're opening up the training gradually June 1st, where we're going to have more isolated trainings throughout the week. And our training officer in the fire department has been great in working through this. <laughs> EMS side, uh, I just want to point out that we instructed an AC, uh, advanced life care support class, a PALS, which is a pediatric event, advanced life support class, and a basic life support class to the ER physicians and anesthetists at Peace Harbor Hospital because they're unable to get the certification required to do their job. They called us. We have people certified to us. So we taught the class for them and which generated off the top of my head, a couple hundred dollars of revenue, but it was more of being there for our partners in the community. Vehicles and fleets, ambulance and apparatus are doing great with no, nothing really out of the ordinary for routine maintenance and nothing drastic to report. Uh, Director Polisi, you asked about the hydrants. I attached the report from Captain Miller that addresses why we do the hydrant testing and green trees, and that's after the meter is why we do that. And did you, have any, did you have any other questions to that report? Uh, it's a great report. That's one of the best staff reports I've ever seen for this type of uh, service that is provided. I agree with it. The only thing that I would suggest is that if uh, Hesita Water is looking to purchase storage fittings for the steamer connections on all the hydrants, maybe the city of Florence would like to look into it as well. And maybe, you know, the public works would like to go in with them and purchase those fittings on their side. Uh, could be a beneficial financial saving of some money. <laughs> but uh, please uh, pass on to Captain Miller. I, I appreciate that report. Nice. I will do, and you're very welcome. Uh, and then why uh, Captain Miller's been on shift work during this COVID trans transition, he's actually been doing a lot of prevention with the shift. Yeah. So we've actually been doing some secession and development for fire prevention, which has been good to see. Uh, community support team continues to do not just great things on scenes and taking care of our staff, but in the mobile 
crisis response team. They've been really in, instrumental in our area and helping with calls with the law enforcement agencies as this crisis has kind of come and started to peak and going down the back end of it. Kudos to Lori and their team. Recruiting retention, again, Director Polisi, I attached uh, another breakdown of staff yeah. report from our R&R &R guy. During, <clears throat> what Summarizing essentially over the existence of the position, we've recruited a total of 47 firefighters. 19 of them remain active. There's a breakdown of why those others are not active. Thank you. I see that. Good. Well done. <laughs> And then uh, one last thing is the mobile integrated healthcare continues to do strong things like Chief Schick had mentioned. They caught a medication error, which ultimately is why we do what we do is patient safety. Uh, that concludes my report. If you guys have any other questions, I'd be happy to help. So a storage connection, just for information of the directors, that's, it hooks onto the hydrant, the large opening, and allows us to have a, a matching set of a connector and it's like, what is it, an eighth turn or a quarter turn? It makes it quarter. for a quick connect. Yeah, quarter so turn. We can, we can connect very rapidly versus having to spin one on and having things cross-threaded. So it just makes it much easier to connect to the hydrant. Okay, Dina, your office manager. Okay. So in answer to Director Farnsworth's question about when we received the mobile integrated healthcare funds, looks like the program started uh, somewhere around July 2017, where we received the first amount of 57,500. And then in May of 2018, we received 50,000. And then in March of 2019, we received 100,000. So, so far we have received $207,500. Okay, so uh, running through those dates, the first payment for, was for which period of time? Well, we received it uh, in July of 2017. Right, and I believe that was for the remainder of the 2017 year. So that I do not have in front of me the exact date that this program started. Okay, well, as I recall, and others could chime in, I think that was for the remainder of that year. So the next payment was received in May of 2018? Yes. And that was 100,000? No, that was 50,000. 50,000, okay. So uh, any other payments received in 2018? Not in 2018. Uh, in March of uh, 2019, we received 100000 Okay, so what we need to know is, <clears throat> I think, you know, the, the cost was 100000 a year, right? That's what we did the budget um, with actually Rick Yesney and I, when we worked on it when he was still employed with Peace Health at the time. Mm -hmm. Rick, we, do, you, do you remember, Rick? I mean, I, I think we're short 50000 here. I, I, I do. I, I think so. I think we'll have to talk about that. I think, I think the program started in January of 18. So 18 to 100000 19 to 100000 And then we budgeted for six months for the end of our fiscal year, this 50000 So mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to check out. I probably have to, somebody will have to follow up on that with Peace Health. So is that person. they're paying two hundred and fifty thousand? Why they're offering us two hundred and fifty thousand now? Because they're going to maintain it at a hundred thousand a year, and the other fifty thousand is to pay the um, the half year. It's it's not. It's it's one hundred twenty five thousand years what's been budgeted. Um, we're just going to have to look into that fifty thousand. Okay. I think it's probably just been an oversight. I, I think when we developed this budget and put fifty thousand there, it was uh, fifty thousand receivable. Yeah, I think we expected to get fifty thousand. Yep. So I think we're kind of in the hole on it right now. But I'm glad to hear that we have a two-year program coming up. That's great. So in addition to that, I wanted to just uh, tell briefly about uh, that. So Valley, uh, we have a 
a computer workstation replacement project underway. And this is what we did budget uh, 30,000 in capital outlay for this. So we, uh, in trying to wrap up our agreement with Lane Council of Governments and their IT services, that included two Dell computer leases, which provided 10 computers at, uh, at this station. And so we have terminated, we have paid off the first lease and we are keeping the equipment and repurposing them at our, to our outer stations. And we are buying out the other lease for $1,400 and returning the equipment. So the quote to replace these 11 stations is 12,000, a little over $12,000. And that includes the labor to set them up. And we've had three of the stations uh, replaced so far. They were replaced this week. And each week through the next month, month and a half, we will have three stations a week uh, replaced by our IT services. And other than that, question, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the PCs that we have that are that are being repurposed. What era were those purchased? 2015. So okay. they are five years old, but the computers at the outer stations are probably 10 years old. So Do any of those computers have access to the internet. Yes, they have access to the internet. What is the operating system those PCs are running? I believe that the ones at the outer stations are still Windows 7, which are, which are, is not supported anymore. Okay. And these stations that we are repurposing, even though they're five years old, they're all Windows 10. Okay. How about the ones in your as office? As long as we know the, there's vulnerability with running 7. Yeah. Yes, we are trying to eliminate all the 7s that are out there. Yeah, great. So the ones that you're repurposing from your office are already Windows 10? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions on that? Just, just one, uh, with our new IT services, are they gonna be able to put in the virus protection intrusion from these outer stations? Well, that's a good question, I'll follow up on that. Um, that should be, I believe Windows 10 has a virus protection component in it. It does. Uh, more importantly, what it has is an active patch management system, which you would not have with Windows 7. Yeah. So as long as that's being run consistently, you're eliminating a lot of the risk. And these computers aren't tied into our main station network either. They're independently on the, the internet out there. It's used for response call volumes and training at the station. Okay. Other than that, I wanted to just confirm that we are still scheduled the, the Western Lane Board Practices Assessment with special districts, uh, which has been postponed two or three times, is still scheduled presently for 4 p.m. on June 25th, which is right before the June <coughs> meeting. And they are starting to do Zoom meetings. So in the event we are not opened up to have in, person meetings yet, we will hopefully be able to get that accomplished via Zoom. What time is that? 4 p.m. June 25th. And we are also going to schedule separate budget hearings for the two districts. So Sayusla Valley Fires budget hearing will be held Thursday, June 11th at 5 p.m and Western Lane Ambulance budget hearing will be held Thursday, June 18th, 5 p.m. In these meetings, I will be sending out Zoom invites for. And that's all I have. I'm sure I'll dress well. <laughs> it's an invite. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Dina, I have just a question, and maybe I could even ask this at the end, but. I know it's, it's probably premature to discuss this now as we haven't even entered phase two of the reopening plan. And I'd like to kind of open the, the conversation at some point in the future about making Zoom at least an option as a permanent solution. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. 
I guess my question would be that, Mr. Green, it is an option. If we choose to, it to be, yes. <laughs> no, actually, actually, it's allowed now. You can, you can. Yeah, we're uh, doing it now. It in. Yeah. We've just never done it for all directors, but it is available for, for individuals or as many as they want. So, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Any more questions for Dina? So for correspondence, we've received uh, some thank you cards. It's, it's in the board packet. Uh, we received some other comments, which we placed in the correspondence section as well. Uh, Director Burns and I were talking about this today, and, and um, there is one unsigned letter in there, and that probably may not be um, correct. We probably should require people to sign their comments, and then we put it into the, uh, the board packet. So uh, going forward, we'll, we'll encourage people to if they want to submit their comments, they're absolutely welcome to, but um, make sure they sign them or give their name. So director comments, I figured that we would do a roll call um, just for Western Lane and SVFR directors. So if you're with Welfia, go ahead and make your comments. We won't go through the third agency, but Mary, if you could run us through for director comments, if, if they have any. Praise the Valley Fire. Um, Director Green. No additional comments, thank you. Director Hickson. No comments, thank you. Director Burns. No comments, thank you very much. A good meeting tonight. Director Polisi. Yes, I do have comments. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who attended this meeting from the general public. Uh, some very good comments, even though I'm on the fire side listening to the EMS portion uh, is very important. As we know that fire and EMS go hand in hand. I don't know if the individual from the EMS district is still on the air about uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, but I feel for you, I went through it. I spent 35 years in the fire service in California and there were some, many incidents make it very clear that I will never get over, but I will tell you that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We are at a very interesting point in time in our history here in the United States, as well as worldwide. Um, we don't know what COVID's gonna do. I don't think we've seen the end of it. I've made, uh, some very important comments about fire and EMS working together. And I sure hope that we can continue to do this is that one agency needs the other. You get a structure fire, you have a rescue, you need EMS there. You get a vehicle accident, EMS needs fire there. So all I'm saying folks is that as we move down the road, let's look at what's best for the community, the taxpayers and the employees. Thank you. Hey, Director Spade. No comments, thank you. Okay. Director Yesney. Uh, no additional comments, thank you. Director Russell. Yes, I have comments. Um, through, first I wanna thank everybody that have um, spoke from the public. I, listened very carefully to everything that everybody had to say. Um, and a lot of what they said goes along with what I wanted to comment on tonight and make sure it's in a public forum that I feel that uh, we're looking at numbers and in the field that I work in of being healthcare, we need to look at quality before we look at numbers. Um, you can't put a number on the life. You can't put a number on the care for our community. The community here expects and deserves to receive um, quality care. The reason I came on this board was to make sure that we um, maintain or exceed what the level of care was when I became a board member. And that is the driving force of me staying here is to make sure that that is brought forward before the numbers are brought forward. I understand we have a responsibility to taxpayers 
but those, those taxpayers are the very ones that um, we need to take care of in a quality way. I had uh, obtained or got a copy of the Western Lane um, Quality Assurance Program a plan that we policy that the Board of Directors passed. And in the vision statement, it states, the vision of Western Lane Ambulance District Emergency Medical Services is to provide structure and future growth of our emergency medical service system. All actions will be dedicated to the continued advancement of quality emergency medical services delivered by Western Lane Ambulance. I believe that is right there is the very directive of what we should be doing here on the board. Uh, when you look at what we are asking of our EMS crews is above and beyond. When it's compared, their salaries are compared to the average EMS, they are not average EMS. They have almost a thousand square miles to cover. They're doing critical care transports and being a nurse, putting my patients' lives in their hands to take them an hour and 15 minutes away from me. Uh, I have turned, turned down one transport in the ER when a private company came in and I did not feel safe giving my patient to that person, to that company, because they were like deer in the headlights when I started talking about all the drips that this patient was on all the medications that can be, that need to have a knowledge base behind it in order to control, because you're controlling that patient's life. I do not want to see our services deteriorate. They are too important to this community, to this hospital, and to each one of us. When you look at what the quality measures are, some of them are um, response time. And I believe that I got this number from Matt, house. I'm not sure that I have the exact right number, but our response times are 95% or higher. For, and for our ASA, that is exceedingly good. Our, we have an MD advisor that does case reviews. We have training competencies that are being met. And if you look at the training report from tonight, you look at what Rob has done, and he's also still working a shift. There has been talk of um, some of the uh, paramedics make more than a physician assistant that's hired into the hospital. I make more money than some of those physician assistants that are hired in the hospital. I'm a staff nurse because of my longevity. The same thing applies to, the, applies to these, these paramedics. They have longevity. If we start uh, degrading them, putting them down in any way, you're gonna be losing them. We have longevity that needs to be honored and cherished. The uh, whole idea of having them, they're first responders, we're putting them on the line, we're putting them out in front of this COVID thing for us, for our community. And to turn around and to offer this to them at this time, I'm having a hard time with it. I support the paramedics and what they do for us, what they're eventually going to do for me and for every one of us on the boards. We need to cherish their knowledge and the difficulties that they go through. That's all I have to say at this time. Okay, Director Murphy. Yes, unfortunately, you get to listen to me for a bit. Chairperson Yesney, I'd like to rec make a recommendation to Western Lane Ambulance Board that we start our strategic plan meetings no later than July 10th. And on that strategic planning committee, I would like to be sure that we have, of course, a ship shift supervisor and one of our paramedics, somebody from Sayuslaw School District, a Sayuslaw Valley board member, a Sayuslaw Valley fire employee, a city employee, what the hospital represented, a Kiwanis member, a Rotarian, a budget committee member, somebody from Florentine, and somebody from Green Trees. We need to do this as quickly as we can. 
it's imperative that we get a good plan for Western Lane Ambulance District moving forward. And then after our strategic plan is done, we review that before we start in the budget process next year. And every budget member is given a copy of that plan. That way it is it will be our budget driver. Thanks. Is that in the form of a motion, John, or would you, I, I know, uh, I believe uh, Chief Schick is already checking on putting together a uh, strategic planning structure. So can we take that under advisement and have a report out possibly at the next board meeting? As long as you get started by July 10. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, Director Farnsworth. Yes, I have a few comments. Uh, John kind of stole my thunder. I was very interested in seeing us begin a new strategic planning process. And I also want to just preface my remarks by thanking everyone who's come and given their comments today. And it's been very helpful for me as a director. And I, I think that what we need to remember is that we're all in this together. Uh, each of the members of our board of directors is a, is a volunteer. <clears throat> and I can tell you that more and more, it seems like being a director is a full-time job. And we're serving and trying to do our very best for the district and the community. Uh, when I was elected, um, I didn't know what was under the hood here. Uh, I did know that there was a strategic plan last done in, in 2016, and so it's been four years since we did a, a strategic plan. Uh, part of that strategic plan that was considered critical was to conduct a financial needs analysis, listing current revenue and expenditures, evaluate each revenue source and expenditure to determine what must be adjusted and set up the appropriate cost of delivery, delivering service. Uh, to, determine a, to, to determine areas to be evaluated in a shared services study, to collaborate and discuss concepts with potential partners, and then to move forward as a, as a board. As we became directors in 2016, this district operated at a loss of $153,000. In 2017, we had a $71,000 gain in 2018, we lost 149,000, and in 2019, we lost 151,000. So as we look at the challenge ahead of us, what we're trying to make sure of is that this district survives and not only prospers, but that the obligations we have to our employees, including their PERS retirement, are secure. So we have a big task in front of us. So what I would suggest is that as board members, we're keenly aware and we are interested in working with our employees and interested in working with the collective bargaining agent. We're looking for solutions that give us a long-term path forward. That's our goal. Um, in terms of strategic planning, this, this board really needs to address having a capital budget, having a building repair and replacement budget, and we need to have enough funds set aside for PERS so that we can make the increasingly larger uh, payments to support that pension. Um, so in that regard, I hope that you'll all uh, understand that any money that's in the district stays in the district. If we're looking for cost savings and better ways of doing business, that money's not going anywhere else. It's staying in the district. It may be repurposed, but it's, it, the money is designed to be used to enhance and increase and maintain the services that we have. It's not going somewhere else. The board isn't being paid. We're just trying to run this district as best we can. Um, the next item I'd like to ask for board direction on is that we have a budget committee that we've, we've, we've asked to serve and uh, Director Murphy did a great job of running our budget meeting, but there is some confusion about uh, volunteer members of the budget committee and when they can give input to the board. Now I looked at the materials that Chief Schick sent out this past week about uh, budget committee workings 
and I can find no place in there where a budget committee member, a non-elected board member, can't give his feedback, his or her feedback during a budget committee meeting since the entire board is there. I think it's kind of antithetical and actually a little bit discourteous to invite community members to come in and vet our budget, but not give them a voice as to what's in it. Uh, now it's true, they don't make decisions, the board makes decisions, but I think that in a budget committee meeting, it's very appropriate for a budget committee member to be able to give their input and the board can consider it from that point. It's, it's awkward to say to a budget committee member, you must leave and come back during a regular board meeting to give us your input during three minutes of public comment. Uh, these are other volunteers serving our, our district and we should respect and give them a voice for their service. So I would like to see that clarified. Um, other than that, I just wanna thank again, everyone for participating and let's get through this together. Let's do our best work together. And uh, I look forward to a bright future. Thank you. Okay, Director Webb. Yeah, I have a few comments. Um, just a little bit of history, I've been around the district a, a little while. I think Matt's been here longer than I have, but that's probably the only one. Uh, back in 2012, when the district first considered the increase in the operating levy, we had a cash carryover position of $1.4 million, but we also had debt of over $300,000. We chose to go to the voters. We asked for a 20 cent increase on our levy to 45 cents. We've been at that levy since 2012, or since the, it was passed 2012, 2013. In 2015, we lost our lead office person and our executive director passed away. Our office was in complete disarray, yet the operation continued to function and function very well because of the quality of the staff that we have. We couldn't have done that without the, the type of people that we have. Not a chance. We were able to bring in a district substitute manager, a very quality person, Brian Burright. And he got us set on a path where the office started to come together. And through strategic planning, it was decided that we, as a district, along with Sisaw Valley, reconsider getting into some kind of IGA where administrative services would be handled together. In the year 2015-16 budget or 16-17 budget, Brian provided budget figures for the IGA and budget figures for non-IGA. It's surprising that the office expense that uh, was set aside for our, us as a standalone district, not including overhead of the building, which continues, but just for personnel and systems was $504,000. Remarkably, that's the same figure that we're presented in this budget for Wafia's, for our share of Wafia's budget. Um, there's discussion about whether we're saving money or not. Right now, we have something with Wafia we never had with a standalone. We have succession and we have redundancy. We don't have a district where if somebody passes away, we're gonna be left without a, a leader. That was a horrible position to be put in as a district. And it, it, there's a reasons why we had cash deficits. Well, that $1.4 million that we had as cash carry, carryover is currently $2.9 million. We have no debt. We purchased three ambulances. We remodeled a building. We bought a bunch of stuff for the district. Our trends with our labor are high. But part of that, a significant part of that, more than wage, wage for people is the call volume. In 2012, our call volume was 1,890. We're pushing 4,000 with the same tax revenue right now. And we really have to consider, perhaps we need more tax revenue because perhaps mm -hmm. we have more demand for our services. And the reason we can't pay for the demand for our services from our patient service fees is the restrictions that Medicare and Medicaid put on us. The demographics of our community have put us in a position where it's best served by a tax district like the ambulance district. 
with strategic planning going forward, we need to look at ways to long-term secure our revenue rather than having to go out for five, every five years for a renewal of our operating levy. But currently, the demand for our services are much, much higher than what they ever were in the past. And that, that's a big driver of why we have a, a declining revenue to, to expense. And we have to look at that from that vantage point too. We have the best darn crew ever, and we have for a very, very long time. Uh, it's very important to keep these people and keep them as happy as we can within reason. But they also have to understand it's got to be a win-win. Everybody's got to be able to afford to live this and work this district. But uh, within our means, if we can't, we can't survive. But we still need to strive to provide the best service that we can for the high quality that our people demand. And I think our voters would more than support going out and continuing to, to fund the district as they have in the past. Uh, in the audit, they marked that we have a very small levy, uh, very 31 cents a thousand is our, our base rate. It, it's, uh, it's insane. We need to do something about that long term. With that, I'm done. Did we lose Mary? I'm here. Is, it, is that all the directors? That's all the directors. Okay, thank you. Could I uh, carry, uh, add something in from what Mike said? That I got the information from Rick Yancey, and I have not looked at my tax bill because I don't pay my taxes, my husband does. But um, from what he was able to garner from his tax bill is that it is costing the average taxpayer maybe a six pack of beer a month to pay for ambulance service. That's yeah, dangerous. Thanks, that's the way I put it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exact his exact words. And that's very, very cheap when you figure we're they're putting our their lives in our hands for the price of a six pack. I have no idea how much a six pack costs. But because I don't drink it's, either. Well no I don't pay taxes or drink. It'll want more a different type. It'll so, be it'll it's a micro brew, don't worry. But I just wanted to add that in that when you like what Mike was saying that we're getting away on a very low tax rate and I agree. Thank you. Thank you. I think Dina went over the future meeting. Did you hit all the future meetings? Dina? All yes, uh, everything except for just a reminder that the Western Lane Budget Committee meeting number two is next Thursday, June 4th at five o'clock. And I just sent out the Zoom invite today. Okay. And Thank I, you. I've heard from all three community <clears throat> committee members that they will attend. And I just, and I have also received, uh, I know that Director Russell and Director Yesney will attend. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that Director Murphy, Farnsworth and Webb will attend as well. Very good. Um, Gina, what was the meeting on the uh, fifteenth? Whoops. Go ahead, Cindy. What Go was ahead. the meeting on the fifteenth? There is no meeting. Uh, the Western Lane budget hearing is scheduled for June eighteenth. Eighteenth. Okay. Thank you. To my fellow board members on both sides and to the general public, I apologize for having to bounce out a few times here and there. Um, I recently had a family member pass away, which is going to take me back to California, but I was just informed uh, about 45 minutes ago of another family member that passed away. Oh, no. So I'm going to uh, step out of this meeting unless somebody has a comment for me or a question for me. Um, Chief, I'll be in touch with you on my itinerary Absolutely. about when I'll, you know, be back and forth. Our thoughts and prayers with you and your family. Oh, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, any comments from anybody to me? All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks, I have Jim. to make some calls. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, so, um, Wester Lane has an executive session scheduled for after this. Rick, do you want to, or Director Yesney, do you want to read that statement? 
Yes, uh, following adjournment, the Western Lane Ambulance District Board of Directors will meet in executive session per ORS 192.6602D to de conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations. Representatives of the news media and audience members are asked to leave the session. No final decisions will be made during the executive session and the board does not plan to return to open session tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Director Esney. And with that, uh, this uh, joint board meeting is adjourned. So to the Western Lane Board, can we um, maybe take a quick break and do you want to uh,